I had to pick one person to play baseball with, it'd be Jackie Robinson. I think I wanted to get an opportunity to uh, hear some of his stories. Obviously, he was a great player, and he meant so much to the game of baseball and so much to uh, life and society as general, in general. So he's someone that I would, I would want in my field of dreams. Well, I think, uh, you know, people look to this game because it's, a, it's America's game. It's America's pastime. It's been there for a long time. It's a game that you can go to as a family. You can enjoy it as a family. I remember going as a, as a youngster with my, with my parents and my younger sister. And it's a game that can be played by everyone. And I think it's a game that relates to everyone. And, uh, you know, I'm proud to play it. I think it's great. I think it, it gives an, to, an opportunity, obviously, to... Uh, give these players what they deserve, but I think it also gives an opportunity to educate the kids about the Negro Leagues because that's something that I'm well aware of, but I think kids coming up today could definitely uh, definitely need to learn about it. I think it's pretty, uh, you know, I grew up playing Pac-Man and Donkey Kong, and now it's, it seems like all of the, the games are so real. I mean, the, the graphics, the players' faces, um, the different situations and scenarios, you know, it's, it's, it's beyond belief. And, uh, you know, I think it makes all the games just that much better. Well, I think you have to keep that in perspective. I don't think there's any way in any promotion whatsoever. And I think MassCard did a great job and MLB did a great job of creating the excitement um, for baseball, tapping into uh, um, people's feelings about the sport. Um, and so I won the popular vote, you know, as far as the moments, but uh, I don't think there's any way you can quantify which Major League Baseball moment was better than another one. And so I think uh, a lot had to do with um, the people that were voting, um, the time frame in which uh, things happened it was only seven years ago. Um, but still, standing on that field and having it counted down um, it makes you feel like you've made a contribution to baseball, that there's a place um, um, in baseball for you. So it was pretty good. Um, the hardest um, adjustment when I move from third to short has to be um, figuring out how I play the position. Part of developing yourself as a player in the minor leagues is you're faced with situations repeatedly where you learn yourself as much as you learn the position. So it's a combination of two things. I mean, it's the position of shortstop that I need to understand, but it's also how do I make the plays at shortstop? Um, what are my skill sets that actually make the whole thing to come together? I was missing um, part of that developmental process by moving to third early on in the minor leagues. And by being developed as a third baseman, I had to go actually th start to think like a shortstop. So then I did that for 15 years. And then have, going back, it was kind of funny that now that I have developed my understanding how to play shortstop, I had to revisit that all over again at third base. Um, I think I had the skill set to actually play both positions, but it's still each position is uh, um, a little bit different and it requires you to kind of think more like a third baseman. Well, again, I, I try to maintain perspective and, and keep it in a real place. And um, I can't believe some of the things that happened to me along the way and some of the success I've had in the sport, enjoying it all along. Um, so I guess I choose to deal with it not really thinking about it. And if it happens, when it happens, then I'll deal with it then. Well, there's many, there was many, many ball players uh, that you could look at as good examples. Um, and my dad pointed out many of them along the way through the minor leagues. I remember Doug DeSensei was one of those guys that took a special interest in me. And dad always thought Doug handled himself really well um, and knew the game and was a real good student of the ball game. Um, and there was many other players like that. But uh, for me at the big league level, um, Brooks Robinson was my guy. Um, he, he was uh, um, someone that made all the exciting plays at the hot corner. Uh, he made unbelievable diving plays and barehanded throws on bunts. And he was an exciting player to, to watch. And so like many players that came from this area, um, uh, you gravitated towards uh, Brooksy. So Brooksy was my guy. Well, again, the dream to be a baseball player period, is one of those dreams that happen to very few. I think all kids grow up that play the game um, have this dream uh, that, they would, that they can make it to the big league someday. I grew up around this area. I had that dream like many other kids in the area, but I also had that dream to play for the Orioles. And if you look at all the other players that are in the big leagues and their uh, exact situations and their past that they've gotten uh, to the big leagues um, from where they came, very few have had things work out the way my career has. Um, I could have been drafted by any team. 
Um, uh, I might have been traded on the way to get to the biggest. I might not have made it here. Mm -hmm. And to actually want to be a baseball player, number one, but also want to be an Oriole, and then having come to, to the Orioles and played for 20 years, I can't think of another person's career that uh, things have worked out better for. Um, there's been so many opportunities to, uh, to challenge yourself and succeed that I don't think there was one clutch moment that I said I wish that I would have performed in. There's a lot of those, I think. I think um, to hit with the bases loaded real consistently through your career um, is a good measure of your, your ability as a clutch hitter. I think I did okay in that. Um, to me, the only at-bat that uh, I wish I had back um, uh, that, that had a lot of meaning was my last at bat period. I mean, uh, everyone uh, celebrated the last game. Uh, it was a wonderful human experience, and I felt more pressure in that moment than I felt, you know, in all the other bats combined. And I really wanted to get a hit. I really wanted to do something. So if there was one I could change, uh, my last at bat in uh, the major leagues, I, I would have liked to have gotten a hit instead of flying out the center. One of our newest additions to All-Star Baseball 2004, we try to present the history of baseball. And one of the most important parts of America's pastime is the Negro Leagues. I recently had a chance to sit down with former Negro League star, 91-year-old John Buck O'Neill. Buck, the title of your book is I Was Right on Time, and it seems to summarize your overall outlook on life, a very positive outlook on life and that might surprise some people how have you been able to stay so positive with all the obstacles that have been thrown in front of you over your lifetime well and one thing about it is is actually to be negative it gains you nothing nothing whatsoever but being positive you know what i mean this is going to turn out all right i'm going to see that it turns out all right but if i think that well this is going to be bad it will be bad the Negro Leagues, in a lot of ways, Buck, seem to promote showmanship. And today you hear so much about showboating. Is there a fine line or is there a line at all between showmanship and showboating? Well, and, and see, showboating didn't come in. You know, Ruth wasn't a showboat. No, no. Ruth was an entertainer. You understand? These mm -hmm. guys were entertainers. That's what baseball sports is all about. You are entertaining the people. But the so-so ball player came up with the title Showboat because the good guy, the superstar, well, say Musio. You understand what I mean? That stare he had. Mm -hmm. So this was uh, the, the, the mediocre ball player. This is a showboat. This is a showboat. No, no, no. Well, it may wasn't a showboat. Mm -hmm. That was his natural way of playing. Ruth's natural way of playing. It wasn't showboating. How about, how about though, Barry Bonds? I, I, is, it, is it showboating when you swing the bat, you hit one nine miles, and you stand there and watch it? Well, and actually, so many people hit him nine miles and, and, and stood there and watched it. But this is Barry Bonds got in bed with the with the writers, mm -hmm. the reporters and things like that, because actually Barry Bonds didn't answer the silly questions. Yes, you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. You're a baseball writer. Uh, you 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 should know the right questions to ask. And uh Barry Bonds, I know Barry Bonds, nice guy. Nice guy. And one of the best ball players ever played. But do you think that the portrayal, whether it's in movies, on television, in magazines, books, whatever the case may be, do you think the portrayal of the Negro Leagues or the Negro League ball player is accurate as to the way it really was? No. No, the soul of the game and, and, and all of those things, that wasn't the Negro League. No, no, no. The Negro League was the third, third largest black business in this country. For it was black insurances. The great white insurances, 10 cent policy, just enough to bury my parents, me, you know. Mm -hmm. Black insurances, they insured our homes, our crops, our stock. They made millions. Next, Madam C.J. Walker. These kids with these plants. Now, Madam C.J. Walker did that 100 years ago. She made millions. Actually, first woman millionaire in this country that earned it. That's Madam C.J. Walker. Next was Negro League Baseball. All you needed was a bus, a couple of sets of uniforms. You could have 20 of the best athletes that ever lived. And they made money. 
They made me pay right here. Cincinnati. And we filled up Crosley. Yeah. See, the Negro Leagues is during my era, the major leaguers, maybe 1% of the major league ball players were college men. Because, you know, they got them right out of high school. Mm -hmm. 40% of the black, the Negro League baseball players were college men because the black college was more or less like a, a minor league for us. We always trained the team, the Negro League team, always trained in a, in, a, in a black college town, and we played them in spring training. That's who we played in spring training. And these guys would go to school in the winter, in the summer, they would come and play baseball. Some of them would... would Come and play baseball or something. Go back to teaching in the in the winter. Mm -hmm. That was Negro League baseball. It was exciting. It really was exciting. You playing with some of the best. You playing with some of the best. And 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 like I say, we play Yankee Stadium. We play Yankee Stadium to forty five thousand people. Yeah. Perhaps the most recognizable name in the history of the Negro League, Satchel Page, and you were a very good friend of his, one of your dearest friends. You were a former teammate of Satchel Page. Since there are so many stories about his popularity, do you think that the common perception of the Negro League player was based on his character and his personality? Well, Satchel was, uh, I would say Satchel Page, Babe Ruth, Dizzy Dean, most charismatic athletes that ever lived. They could sell it. They could sell it. This was a satchel. This is why you heard so much about satchel. Satchel was a natural show. Mm-hmm. Satchel was a natural showman. Mm-hmm. Say, I'm going to get you. And he did get you. You understand what I mean? Mm -hmm. A dizzy dean. I'm going to get you. I, and did get you. Baby Ruth, I'm going to hit you out. And did hit you out. It was, it was actually, they had it, and it was a time in doing that era you had it, you showed it. Right now, it, it seemed like they want you to suppress it. But that's still not the good baseball fan. Mm -mm. The good baseball fan wants you to show it. If you got it, flaunt it. That's baseball. That's sports, period. Now, i got to ask you if this story is true. In 1942, you're playing in the World Series for the Kansas City Monarchs against the Homestead Grays. Did Satchel Paige really intentionally walk two batters so he could face Josh Gibson with the whole World Series on the line? Is that true? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, their rivalry was that. Yeah. He won. See, 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 all that started. That started. See, Satchel and Josh played with the Pittsburgh Crawfords. That one of the best ball clubs that ever assembled. See, five guys from that team is in the Hall of Fame. Now they played at the same time. So, actually, they, this was before the turnpike. Then, and uh, we would go over the mountains from Pittsburgh going east, New York, Washington, and have up the mountain to stop to put water in the bus and stuff. We'd throw rocks down the mountain, things like that. And so I said, you know what, John? I believe you're the best hitter on the world, in the world. I know I'm the best pitcher. One day we're going to be on opposite sides, and we're going to see who's the best. Okay. So we're in Pittsburgh. We played the World Series. We played the World Series game in, in Washington. We played it in a different ballpark. And now we're in Pittsburgh. We're playing. We get the ball game. We get two outs in the ninth, <coughs> excuse me, in the ninth inning. Two outs in the ninth inning. We're leading the ball game by a couple of runs. And, uh, Jerry Benjamin comes up fast, and he hits the ball down the left field line. Fair ball jumps in the foul territory. He stands up a triple. Cut Satchel called me Nancy. He said, Nancy, come here. I said, okay. He said, you know what I'm going to do? I said, yeah, get, you're going to get uh, uh, this other guy out, and we go into the hotel. He said, no, uh-uh, it's not going to be like that. I'm going to walk Howard Easterland. I'm going to walk Buck Leonard. I'm going to pitch to Josh Gibson. And I said, man, don't be facetious. He said, you can call it what you want to call it, but that's what I'm going to do. I said, time. Frank Duncan was managing the ball club. We had Crosby Field. Not the Crosby Field, the Pittsburgh Field. And anyway, I said, 
skipper, come out here and see what this boy talking about. Get out there and I said, Sasha, tell, tell the skipper what you just told me. He said, okay, he told him. He looks around. We got 35,000 people in the ballpark, the manager, Frank Duncan. He said, Buck, you see all these people in here? They came to see Satchel and Josh. Whatever Satchel want to do, let him do it. I said, okay, it's your ball game. I go back and listen. Satchel walked Easterland. He walked Buck and, and Josh sitting there with that bat, look like it's that long, you know. The old Lord. And he said, now, Josh, you remember when we were going on the mountain, I say I thought you the best hitter in the world and I the best pitcher. Come on, throw the ball, Satchel. This is the day. I'm going to throw you some fast balls. Boom. 95 mile an hour fast ball. Strike one. Josh didn't move the bat. He said, now I'm going to throw you another fast ball, but it's going to be a little faster than that other one. Bam. Strike two. Mm-hmm. 98 miles an hour fast ball. He said, now, nah, Josh, I got you two strikes and no ball. I'm supposed to knock you down. I'm supposed to move you back off the plate. Nah, got you in the hole. But I'm not going to throw in your smoke and your yoke. I'm going to throw a P at your knee. Boom. A hundred mile an hour fast ball knee high. Just don't move the bat. We walk off the field and Satchel six, 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 four. Looked like he's seven feet tall. He stretched out. He said, you know what Nancy? say? I said, what Satchel? Nobody. Nobody hit such a fastball. I say, I guess you're right, Satch. That's such a page. Well, when I see the computer image of myself, I think it's pretty realistic until I get out. And then, uh, you know, I don't like it too much. So I need to try to make this game, you know, uh, make me look a little bit better. Well, I often wonder um, what things would have been like if I would have pitched. Um, if I remember right, if memory serves me correctly, uh, there were very few teams interested in meeting an everyday player. And I think the Orioles were one of the few. Um, so most of the people that scouted me wanted me to pitch. And um, who knows how that would have turned out. Uh, but looking back, having the opportunity to, uh, um, to play every day, and then because I think that's what it boiled down to, that decision. And I had the ability to make that decision within the Oriole organization because uh, Mr. Weaver or Weaver saw me hit. My dad was involved in the situation. The decision came down to, you know, if you play um, regular position first, you can always come back to pitching. But if you pitch first and you're away from the game in a hitting capacity, you, you lose that window to develop, and it probably wouldn't work that way. But the real reason that I wanted to um, play every day was I wanted to play in every game. I mean, it wasn't a streak thing. It was like a pitcher to me, starting pitcher, played one day and had four days off, missed four games. Um, I couldn't get past that concept. I, I wanted to be in the game all five games. Um, my own record, um, the consecutive game streak record, um, I see it very simply and bluntly. If I could do it, why couldn't somebody else? I mean, sure, it takes a little bit of luck, a lot of desire, a lot of passion, uh, and you have to prove yourself worthy to be on the lineup every single day. Um, but if it happened with me, why well, certainly it could happen with someone else. Um, one of the ones that, uh, um, that I think um, uh, are almost un is almost untouchable would be the 56-game hitting streak. Um, it seems like nowadays the scrutiny, the attention is so great that uh, I don't think I've had a hitting streak any more than 16 games, I think, in the big leagues. And the pressure starts to build internally just to try to get a hit. I can't imagine what some of the guys go through, um, uh, the Molitors and the Roses and those guys that have pushed 30 um, high 30s or, or 40 games, what they have to go through just to, to get to, to perform and get a hit. So I think the 56-game uh, hitting streak um, um, is as close to untouchable, I think, uh, as, as any, uh, any of them are. The Oreo Way was no more than um, a group of guys getting together, um, studied baseball, taught baseball, kept uh, the things that actually worked, and discarded the ones that didn't, and they built on that each and every year. My dad was a part of those people that, uh, that helped um, build what was known as the Oreo Way. Um, basically, it was a system of uh, how to play the game, how to teach the game, um, it was about a uh, certain behavior and a certain way you handled yourself. And the Orioles organization, the Orioles model, uh, the Orioles way, um, was the way. It was one of the best models. And uh, uh, 
the success was enjoyed all the way at the big league level um, in the form of championships and it was a uh, stream of talent that was developed through the Orioles system that was dispersed all the way through the big league. So um, the Orioles model was definitely looked upon as you know, one of the baseball models, hence the Oriole way. I thought growing up in a baseball environment was the best thing that, that, that you could do. I mean, I, I love the game of baseball. I got the love of the game of baseball from my father. He didn't have to drill that into me, but he, he certainly showed me how happy he was when he put his uniform on and by his overall attitude and his, his behavior and how much he loved baseball, um, I was able to soak that up. And being around that, uh, I love baseball, I love to learn baseball, and I had uh, in my father the baseball encyclopedia, but I also had many other books and resources in the form of players that I could go ask questions. If I wanted to learn about pitching, I could go ask a pitcher. If I wanted to learn about hitting or or fielding or even catching, I could have someone right in front of me to ask. So it was a great learning opportunity. And sometimes I wonder what other kids do when they're learning baseball. And uh, it makes me really think how fortunate, fortunate I was to have all those uh, questions that kids normally have um, answered and answered so right. No, I think uh, recently um, I pulled myself out of consideration basically for a, a matter of time. Um, it seemed like when I announced my retirement, every single uh, question or every th single interview that I had after that, they would ask me, would I ever come back into professional baseball? And my answer was always very consistent. It was as a player and as a manager now, even though, not as a player, as a manager, as a manager and a coach. <coughs> as a manager and coach, um, those two jobs appeal to me, and then uh, I've, I've learned a lot, and I've, and I've paid attention, and I certainly have qualified, you know, to attempt those particular jobs. At this point, it would tie me to the same schedule that I've been uh, running to all these uh, these years, and I need to have the time to spend with my family, kind of break that. But I'd always qualify that by saying, is if there was ever an opportunity for me to help shape an organization. Um, uh, I just talked about the Oriole Way. My dad was part of the Oriole Way. I witnessed that. Uh, a system of, of teaching. Um, I learned as a kid. I came through the minor league system. I came all the way to the big leagues and had a long career and paid attention to what was going on. So certainly I've developed philosophies that I'd like to put to the test. And if there was an opportunity or a job that would allow me to do that, then I certainly would, would consider that. And that ba that's basically what I said all this time. And just so happened that the Orioles uh, were changing the structure of their front office at the same time. And I became, uh, came into consideration. But um, things happen so fast, and uh, maybe the timing of this opportunity uh, happened a little bit too fast, but I certainly would be open uh, to, to such an opportunity, you know, um, right away. Well, um, by no means I try to keep that in perspective. I didn't um, um, revolutionize or change. Um, I think my success at the position um, might have changed the mindset ever so slightly to, to consider other players of bigger size. Certainly the stereotype in the middle infield um, uh, right before me was more about a defensive player, a smaller guy um, um, uh, that could cover the infield, and they pl placed a big um, emphasis on that type of guy. I think when Earl Weaver decided to move me over, um, and I am a bigger guy, and, and I went over there and the success that I had and started to open up the mind of other people who were making up uh, um, their teams and they started to consider someone. Instead of branding someone as a, a stereotype saying, well, he's going to grow and he's going to get big big for the position, or he might be too big for shortstop, and start to move him to first or to, to third base, um, they were more apt to give someone an opportunity. So when I look back on it, um, you know, I feel good that my success at least might have changed the mindset because I think that's been an improvement in the game. You look at some games' greatest players right now, and they happen to be shortstops. So shortstops, um, the position is being celebrated a lot by the quality of the people that play it, and that makes me proud when I see the success of those guys out there today. Well, the Aberdeen Project um, started out um, uh, with a love of the game of baseball and a passion for trying to um, influence the grassroots um, in, in the form of an academy and, and a great facility. Um, uh, what it is right now is it also has a minor league team there that I'm an owner of the minor league team and we were very successful. It's an Oriole affiliate. It was a great form of family entertainment. Um, so that's a big stadium there. Um, what Really what I'm jazzed about is, uh, is creating more fields that will bring 
um, the experience of learning baseball to a higher level. And when I say that, you can enjoy baseball out in the middle of a field. You can enjoy baseball uh, in a gym being taught. You don't have to have a real great facility. But the experience I'm looking for is to actually merge good quality teaching and understanding of the game and enjoyment at that level with a great facility. And the only way that I can explain that is there's such a feeling that comes over you as a big league player when you go into Fenway Park and when you go into Wrigley Field or Yankee Stadium and you compete in that environment. Uh, it, it, it's the facility that helps bring um, the experience uh, to life. And then I realized that only this many people ever get to feel that. And so a select few that get to make it to the big leagues and, and have a career. So my idea would be to bring that sort of experience or that sort of feeling all the way down and reduce it to, uh, to the kids that, that, that can experience at the grassroots level. Therefore, um, allowing them to feel the same thing that I felt um, all these years. And so that's why it's important to build quality facilities and, and build unique structures so that you can teach the game um, the way it's supposed to be taught, but also you can enjoy the experience of playing it in the best facility that you can. Well, Earl was fun to play for. I didn't get a chance to play for him um, uh, as long as some other people. I had a couple of years with him. But, uh, you know, he's a great baseball man, and uh, he was intense, and uh, he cared about the outcome of the game. He cared about that pitch, um, and he was into the game all the time. So as, as a manager, um, or as, from a player's perspective to the manager, you knew that there wasn't anything about that game that he hadn't considered. He was always two or three innings ahead in his thought, and he was very consistent with the way he approached uh, the game, and I enjoyed very much playing for him. The Negro League players, Buck, did a lot of barnstorming back in the old days. You traveled to places all over the world. What were the advantages, or were there any disadvantages, to playing that many games all year round? Well, this was your living, just like you work. This is your, you work all the year round. Right. Yeah, we play baseball all the year round. Wasn't nothing wrong with it. And and actually. The sweet part about going to Cuba, um, Mexico, I've realized that in Mexico, I was a baseball player. Here, I was a black baseball player. Mm -hmm. In Mexico, I went any place I wanted to go, stayed in the best hotels, at best restaurant, best everything. And here, well, in I'm segregated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was the difference. Segregation now, segregation in the South and segregation up here was just as different as night and day. See, I knew where I could go in Birmingham. Mm -hmm. I knew where I could go in Memphis. But uh, I would come up here, I don't know where I can go. Right. See, because I'd go to the places they couldn't say, you can't come in, but they wouldn't feed me. And different things like that. And they go to a hotel or make a reservation to get to the hotel that don't have any rooms for me. That was up here. But I, in, in, in Birmingham, I wouldn't go to the White Hotel in the first place. Mm -hmm. And uh, but all of that started changing. All of that started changing. And it was a, a good change, too. Jackie Robinson Buck will forever be remembered as the player who broke the color barrier in the history of Major League Baseball. But was Jackie Robinson a braver man than any other player who may have been the first Negro League player to become the first Major League player? He was the right guy. I knew guys were <clears throat> actually might have been better than he were at the, he was at the time. But the guys that I knew. They had thrown that cat on the field. He would have picked that cat up and took it in the stand and jammed it down the sucker's throat. That would have been the end of it. Might have been 50 more years before it happened. But Jackie knew. Jackie had a whole race of people on his back. And I knew Jackie Robinson. Jackie Robinson hey, was as far as anybody that ever lived and could do. Yeah. Jackie would fight. Jackie could do these things. And when he, we knew he could play. But we wondered if he's going to take all of this abuse. He was the right guy because he did it. And I believe that's why he died early. These things that he had to hold in. The real fan didn't boo Jackie here in Cincinnati. The guys that booed Jackie here in Cincinnati was the haters. That's what they came to the ball for. Not the baseball fan. The baseball fan always said, 
can you play? See, baseball, the start of integration was baseball. When Branch signed Jackie, that was the start of integration. Hmm? That was the start of the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. Because that was before uh, Brown versus Board of Education. Before Sister Rosa Parks said, hell, I ain't going to the back of the bus today. Martin Luther King was a sophomore in Morehouse. Baseball. Sports. It is. Mm -hmm. Did the financial success of the Negro Leagues actually hurt the whole integration process with Negro League players becoming Major League players? The Negro League Baseball made money for the Negro, uh, for the Major Leaguers. We played Yankee Stadium for 45000 you know, and, you know, we, they're getting a percentage off that gate, get all the concessions. They own the Newark Ball Club in, 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 in the International League, and the Newark Eagles played in that ballpark. They got a percentage there, all the concessions. We played in Kansas City, the Kansas City Blues, Yankee franchise. Mm -hmm. Mm hmm They got all the concessions and stuff. We made money. See, Rube Forst organized the Negro League, 1920. He thought if he's organized the black ball players, the National League would take a black team and the American League would take a black team. Mm -hmm. But it was until Jackie. But it happened. And why do you think Brad signed Jackie? We played Yankee Stadium to 45,000 people. And on that Sunday, that same Sunday, Branch is playing over there in Flatbush. He got 20,000 people. You understand? Mm -hmm. 99 and 9 tenth percent of that 45,000 people we had in Yankee Stadium black. And Branch, the astute businessman that he was, he saw this. This is a brand new clientele. Mm hmm. Yeah. So actually, when he signed Jackie, that's the death knell of, of Negro League Baseball. Yeah. Many people may not know, but you were actually the first African-American coach in Major League history. Is that something you look back on and you're proud of? No, well, and one thing about Jimmy Wright, writer for the, for, in Chicago, he said, Buck, I know it, I know you, you're all excited and everything, you're so happy that you were the first black coach in the Major League. I said, Jim, it's, it's kind of bittersweet to me. He said, oh? I said, yeah, you know, it's sweet because I, I don't have to be traveling all over the country in my car and I'm making more money. That's the sweet part about it. But the bitter part, baseball is over 75 years old, and I'm the first black coach. I knew Ruth Foster. I knew C.I. Taylor. You know, I knew Frank. I knew guys who were qualified for this job 75 years ago, and I'm the first black I can't stick my chest out. No. I say, uh-uh. It baseball looks kind of bad for me at this time that I am the first black. Did you ever want to manage in the major leagues? Not necessarily. Not necessarily, really. Because I had managed in the Negro Leagues. And, and uh, with my coach, and the, the reason I coached in the major leagues was the fact, you know, Mr. Wrigley came up with that school. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that was why... I was there for that, but it it wasn't much change for me because I'd been, you know, I went to spring training with the Cubs, worked the Cub ball players. They left. I worked the double A, triple A, right on uh, uh, A to uh, right on the D. I knew every ball player in the Cub system. I knew every coach, every manager. I knew the general manager. Knew Mr. Ricky. I knew Mr. Ricky. I knew everything about that system. So. When I went in there, it's just I'm there with about another bunch of friends. Which former Negro League players should be in baseball's Hall of Fame that aren't there right now? Oh man, we got a list. I wish I had brought the list there because Mule Suttle should be there. Mm-hmm. Newt Allen should be there. Willard Brown should be there. We got I had about five or six guys that actually should be in the Hall of Fame. But what I'd like for them to do is uh just all of the Negro League ball players that should be in the Hall of Fame that's qualified, I wish they would put them in at one group. Don't put them on that list because if they put them on that list, oh, they won't have a chance. Right. Or yeah. they continue to wait and wait and wait. Yeah, yeah. they wouldn't have a chance. See, just like, like after 
the first group, Satchel and them went in, and some more guys went in, and it was a spell where about 20 years before anybody went in mm -hmm. because of the fact that they couldn't. Here is, you would have, a, say, a guy going to be competing against a Leo DeRocha, a Negro League ball player. Well, he wouldn't have a chance because you got stats on Leo DeRocha from D-ball until he finished managing. But the Negro Leaguers, you didn't have that many stats on him, so he didn't have a chance. So I told him, I said, we don't have a chance here to put anybody in. What I would like for you to do is segregate this thing. What I want you to do is is put the Negro Leaguers on a different ballot. They say, yeah? I say, yeah. Put them on. They say, okay, Buck, I'll give you five years. They gave me five years, and I put five. Every year I'd get a Negro League ball player in. Then when the five years, years up, I say, I need five more. So they say, all right, we, I'll give you three more. They gave me three more, and I got that. See, and then now that that uh, we are not on that committee anymore, so I'm going to I'm going to try and uh, intercede that they would put you know the Negro League ball players that supposed to get and just vote them all in at one time. In your book, you listed an all-time Negro League team. I'm curious to know if you could field a team from all players from any league. Who would be on your all-time team? I mean, I know it's hard my to kitchen, do. My, my kitchen would be Josh Gibson and your kitchen right here. Johnny What's Bench? It? Johnny Bench. Mm -hmm. Those would be my two catchers. First base, I'd have Lou Gehrig. Mm -hmm. I'd put Jack at second base. Mm -hmm. That's what I'd do. And... Uh, at third base, I'd put Smith. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, at shortstop, I maybe go, hmm, it's a good position. Either one of these guys, now, Ernie would have been a good guy for me. Yeah, I got that power. I got that pop there at shortstop. Mm -hmm. And uh, the outfield, oh. oh, man, you got so yeah. many. I mean, how do people do it? <laughs> Yeah, how you gonna pick them? How you gonna pick them? You got so many great outfielders there because really would have to be one of my outfielders. Mm hmm Guy you never saw. Cool Papa Bell. Really? That's my lead off hitter. Mm-hmm. Had to be my outfielder. Mm-hmm. And the uh, next guy you never heard of him. Oscar Charleston. Oscar Charleston was the guy could hit you 50 home runs, steal your 100 bases, played with Indianapolis in the Negro Leagues. Actually, with me, I believe the best major league ball player I've ever seen was Willie Mays. But, uh, and we old timers say the closest thing to Oscar Charleston was Willie Mays. The team I picked, I could pick another team just as good. Yeah. Yeah. I could pick another team just as good. Right. Mm -hmm. If you could play catch today at 91 years young with any player from the past or any player who's currently playing in baseball, who would be? Who to would play be? catch with him right now, I think I would rather play catch with Elrod. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think I'd rather play catch with him down in Texas. Yeah. Because he just might be the best baseball player that's playing right now. All right, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to just say a name for you. And you, you tell me what's, what, what you think of when I say this name. Rube Foster. Rube Foster, great mind. But Rube Foster was a great pitcher, too. Great pitcher, but great mind, great mind, very intelligent baseball mind. Mm hmm. That's a DeRosha, great baseball mind. Mm hmm. Smokey Joe Williams. Great arm. Great pitcher. Yeah, tall, good looking. And could throw that fire ball, uh huh, and uh, everything else. Pop Lloyd. Pop Lloyd. That's another infielder. Play thought shortstop. Could play shortstop. All the range, the good arm, and great hitter. Oscar Charleston. Uh oh, the best that ever played. 
Oscar Charleston. Great arm, run the ball down, great speed, great speed, and hit the ball out of anybody at the ballpark and hit regular. These guys, they're 350 or better lifetime batting averages. This kind of guy. Satchel Page. Oh, man. That was everything that day. You had it all. You had it all. Great pitcher, great showman. Great showman. Had the greatest arm I've ever seen. Mm hmm. The pitch. The best control of anyone that ever threw a ball. Mm hmm. Josh Gibson. Great catcher. Great catcher. Great hands. Great hands. Great throwing arm. And one of the best hitters that ever lived. Not only power, a great hitter. See, I would say, uh, like the guys now said, uh, uh, who let me get somebody in my mind, Sosa McGuire. Great power hitters. They are great hitters. They're good hitters. But when you say Ruth, Josh Gibson, Oscar Charlton, not only great power hitters, great hitters. These guys, you know, better than 350 lifetime batting average. Cool Papa Bell. Cool Papa Bell, smooth, smooth, fast, fast and smooth, could steal the bases. Really, when I first saw him, New Allen was our second baseman. He said, Buck, better come in a little. Cool's at that. I come in a couple of steps. And he said, you better come in a little further. I said, okay, I come in. But, you know, I'm thinking, well, he can't beat me. I'll back off a little. See? And he hit the ball. The second base, Lou, get up the ball to throw it. And she cool. Boom, boom. Cool could fly. Cool. I saw cool did something I'd never seen before. And I've seen him do it more than once. Score from first base on a bunted ball. This is what happened. The play, it's a made play. Cool's on first. Cool could steal second standing up. Bunt the ball to third base. Cool stealing second. School is at second when the ball laid down. Cool get coming right on around the third base. The catcher got to come down to cover third base because third base went in the field the ball. See? And Cool just runs right by the catcher and why he can score. The pitcher Looking at cool run until it comes in the home plate. That's cool score on that plate. Now, where did that story come from about him turning out the lights and being in That's Satchel. Boy? That was Satchel. Satchel. Satchel and cool roommates with the Pittsburgh Crawford. And get to the hotel that night. Cool goes upstairs. Satchel down on the desk, picking at the girl on the desk, trying <laughs> to make a deep. And uh, cool hit the light switch, you know, a few seconds. Before the light came on, thought a while, hit it again, was a few seconds before the light went out. Mm-hmm. Satchel comes up, Satchel gets to bed, cool, ready for bed, he's standing at the light switch, he said, you know what, Rumi? I can cut off this light and get in bed before the room gets dark. He said, Rumi, you're fast, but you ain't that fast. He said, I bet you you me a money. Satchel got took the bait. So naturally, Satchel in bed, cool, hit the switch, jumps in bed, covers up, and you know that shortage was there. Then the light finally went out. <clears throat> so long as Satchel lived, he always told the story. Cool was so fast, cut out the light, get in bed before the room got dark, but he never told him about the shortage in the light switch. Mm -hmm. Smart yeah. guy. Yeah, good story. Ernie Banks. Ernie Banks, that was my boy. Ernie Banks, I signed him to a Monarch contract, then I signed him to a club contract. See, but the Monarch contract, now, I signed him and had never seen him play. Cool Papa Bell, we had, we went, we go to spring training in uh, 1950, and we got so many ball players in spring training that uh, we aren't going to have but 20 ball players, and we got enough for another ball club there, and these kids could play. So Tom Beard, who owned the ball club, said, I'm going to start a new team. We got cool to manage that team. So they go out, uh, go out, uh, go out north and northwest. And uh, so 
Cool saw this kid from Texas playing on a semi pro team, and when he come come back in 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 the fall of the year, our season was just about over. That was over. Then he said, uh, "Well, uh, Buck, I saw a kid from Texas that could play shortstop for you." I said, "Yeah." He said, "Name Ernie Banks," and so that uh, that next spring, I went down and signed Ernie to a monarch contract. Mm -hmm. Pretty good sign. Yeah, pretty good sign. Don't sign him again. See now, and son, he played with us in 1950, 51, 52. He goes into service. Back in 53, this is when the Cubs signed him, and uh, we played in the East West game. Uh, that's our East West game. That's our All Star mm -hmm. game in Chicago, and we played that day. And then the uh, the Cubs wanted to sign him, and so Tom told me, called the hotel, said, "Bring him in out to the ballpark," and the Cubs going to sign him tomorrow morning. So we did Wendell Smith, who was a writer. He picked us up and took us out to the ballpark. And uh, the, uh, the guy, the general manager, said, Buck, well, and I tell you what, said, that baseball of yours, Negro League baseball, just about over. And well, Tom's going to sell this ball club. And when he does, I want you to come and scout for the Cubs. I said, that's all right for me. See, and so what I want you to do, your first job here is to sign on into this contract. So I signed it. Lou Brock. Lou Brock, <clears throat> Southern University. I saw him as a kid here, yeah, and uh, they had a short right field fence. He's laying right field, and uh, they'd hit the ball to him, and the guys, you know, and uh, go into first base. He'd pick up that ball, ball hit hard enough through a guy at first base. I said, hmm. This kid looked pretty good. He could fly. Mm -hmm. So that was his freshman year. And I saw him. Oh, his sophomore year. He had a great year. Yeah, everybody, all the scouts looking at him. See? But come up, his sophomore year, this is the year he can sign. I mean, it's his it's, it's junior year. He can sign. He said, had a bad spring in Louisiana. And uh, field nice cold and all that. And so... Actually, he didn't look that good. See, there was a scout, and most of the scouts would come. They were white, and they would come over there and see infield practice or something like that, and then they'd go to LSU. And, and, but I stuck right there with him, see, and saw him, and I told him, I said, now, nah, somebody's going to try to sign you, but just may, let me be the last guy, and whatever they give you, I'm going to give you more. He said, okay. So <clears throat> I'm in... Uh, I was in, uh, <coughs> excuse me, I'm in Kansas City. And uh, the general manager called me and said, uh, uh, Lou is in town. He's working out with the, with the White Sox. And uh, and uh, I don't know, they're going to try to sign him. I said, don't worry about a thing. I'll be there. So I came to Chicago, and the next day I had him over with the Cubs working out. Because he told me he told me he's going to wait. And so this, I signed Lou right there in the Cubs office. Jackie Robinson. Jackie played with the Kansas City Monarchs. I wasn't there. See, now, when Jackie got there in 1945, I'm in Subic Bay in the Philippines. I'm in the service. Mm -hmm. And uh, the uh, officer in charge said, I'm a bosun. I'm, o or I'm over. Uh, I had a. Stevedo platoon, and uh, it's 11 o'clock at night, everybody in bed. The officer calls, say, Boson O'Neill, come to my office at once. I say, oh, hell, what did I do now? I go to the I thought maybe I had to go out and unload a ship or something like that. He said, you know what? I said, no, sir. Branch Rick had just signed Jackie Robinson to an organized baseball contract. I said, thank God it finally happened. Give me that horn. I got on the horn. I said, hear this, hear this, hear this. Woke everybody up. Brad Trick had just signed Jackie Robinson to an organized baseball contract. They shot the guns. They hoofed and hollered. We didn't sleep much that night. And Hilton Smith told me this. When Jackie came, see, Jackie was a little different than we were. We were acclimated to segregation, not Jackie Robinson. <coughs> We'd been going to a town in Oklahoma <coughs> for 20 years. 
we had never gone to the restroom because a sign on the restroom door said white men on it. That we played that night in the town. Get up the next morning. We go to the filling station. We leave in town, and uh, the man he comes out say, "Oh, you boys played a great game last night. Put on a great show. Fill up the ballpark as usual. Put the hose in the tank." Jackie gets off the bus and started to the restroom. Where you going, boy? Going to the restroom. Boy, you know you can't go to that restroom. Jackie said, take the hose out the tank. The man thought a while. We got a 50-gallon tank on this side. We got a 50-gallon tank on that side. He's not going to sell that much gas to one customer until we got back there again. He said, you boys go to the restroom, but don't stay long. But the gist of that story was this. From that day on, the monarchs never got gas at the station. They couldn't go to the bathroom. They never stayed in the town. They didn't have a place for them to eat, a place for them to sleep. Jackie said, you know, this is a capitalistic society. You live, you you actually making money with these people. I think you're taking a lot of things you really don't have to take. That was Jackie Robinson. I hope you've enjoyed this interview with Buck O'Neill. I can only tell you that it's been my privilege to broadcast Major League Baseball games for the last 15 years. And that was as exciting and moving an interview as I've ever had a chance to be a part of. We'll continue to bring you more about the history of baseball in years to come. Thanks for being with us on All-Star Baseball 2004. Ernie Banks. Ernie Banks, that was my boy. Ernie Banks. I signed him to... Uh... Monarch contract, then I signed him to a club contract. See, but the Monarch contract, now, I signed him, had never seen him play. Cool Papa Bell. We had, we went, we go to spring training in uh, 1950, and we got so many ball players in spring training that uh, we aren't going to have but 20 ball players, and we got enough for another ball club, then these kids could play. So Tom Bell, who owned the ball club, said, uh, I'm going to start a new team. We got cool to manage that team. So they go out, uh, go out, uh, go out north and northwest. And uh, so cool saw this kid from Texas playing on a semi pro team. And when he come come back in, in, in the fall of the year, our season was just about over. The day it was over. See, and he said, uh, well, uh, Buck, I saw a kid from Texas that, could play shortstop for you. I said, yeah. Say the name Ernie Banks. And so that uh, that next spring, I went down and signed Ernie to a Monarch contract. Mm -hmm. Pretty good sign. Yeah, pretty good sign. Don't sign him again. See, now, and he played with us in 1950. 51, 52, he goes into service. Back in 53 is when the Cubs signed him. And uh, we played in the East-West game. The, that's our East-West game. That's our All-Star mm -hmm. game in Chicago. And we played that day, and then the uh, the Cubs wanted to sign him. And so Tom told me, called the hotel, said, bring Ernie out to the ballpark. And the Cubs going to sign him tomorrow morning. So we did Wendell Smith, who was a writer. He picked us up and took us out to the ballpark. And uh, the uh, the guy, the manager, said, Buck, well, and I tell you what, said, that baseball of yours, the Negro League baseball, is just about over. And... Tom's going to sell this ball club, and when he does, I want you to come and scout for the Cubs. I said, that's all right for me. See, and so what I want you to do, your first job here is to sign on into this contract. So I signed it. Lou Brock. Lou Brock, <clears throat> Southern University. I saw him as a kid here, and uh, they had a short right field fence. He's playing right field, and... Uh, They'd hit the ball to him, and the guys, you know, and uh, go in first base. He'd pick up that ball, ball hit hard enough through a guy at first base. I said, hmm, this kid looked pretty good and could fly. Mm -hmm. So that was his freshman year, and I saw him. Oh, his sophomore year, he had a great year. Yeah, everybody, all the scouts looking at him. See? But come up sophomore year, this is the year he can sign. I mean, it's, 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 it's junior year. He can sign this year. Had a bad spring in Louisiana, and uh, fields were ice cold and all that, and so actually he didn't look that good. See, there was a scout, and most of the scouts would come. They were white, and they would come over there and see infield practice or something like that, and then they'd go to LSU, 
and and but I stuck right there with him, see, and saw him, and I told him, I said, now somebody gonna try to sign you, but just me, let me be the last guy, and whatever they give you, I'm gonna give you more. He said, okay. So <clears throat> I'm in. Uh, I was in. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. I'm in Kansas City, and uh, the general manager called me and said. Uh, uh, Lou is in town. He's working out with with the White Sox, and uh, and uh, I don't know. They're gonna try to sign him. I said, "Don't worry about a thing. I'll be there." So I came to Chicago, and the next day I had him over to Cubs working out. Cause he told he he told me he's gonna wait, and so this I signed Lou right there in the Cubs office. Jackie Robinson. Jackie played with the Kansas City Monarchs. I wasn't there. See, now, when Jackie got there in 1945, I'm in Subic Bay in the Philippines. I'm in the service. Mm-hmm. And uh, the uh, officer in charge said, I'm a bosun. I'm, o- or I'm over, uh, I had a stevedo platoon. And uh, it's 11 o'clock at night, everybody's bed. The officer calls a Bosun O'Neill, come to my office. At once. I said, oh, hell, what did I do now? I go to the I thought maybe I had to go out and unload a ship or something like that. He said, you know what? I said, no, sir. Branch Rickett just signed Jackie Robinson to an organized baseball contract. I said, thank God it finally happened. Give me that horn. I got on the horn. I said, hear this, hear this, hear this. Woke everybody up. Branch Rickett just signed Jackie Robinson to an organized baseball contract. They shot the guns. They hoofed and hollered. We didn't sleep much that night. And Hilton Smith told me this. When Jackie came, see, Jackie was a little different than we were. We were acclimated to segregation, not Jackie Robinson. (coughs) We'd been going to a town in Oklahoma (coughs) for 20 years. We'd never gone to the restroom because a sign on the restroom, those are white men only. We played that night in the town, get up the next morning, we go to the filling station, we leave in town, and uh, the man, he comes out, says, oh, you boys played a great game last night, put on a great show, fill up the ballpark as usual, put the hose in the tank. Jackie gets off the bus and started to the restroom. Where are you going, boy? Going to the re- Boy, you know you can't go to that restroom. Jackie said, take the hose out the tank. The man thought a while. We got a 50-gallon tank on this side. We got a 50-gallon tank on that side. He's not going to sell that much gas to one customer until we got back there again. He said, you boys go to the restroom, but don't stay long. But the gist of that story was this. From that day on, the monarchs never got gas at the station. They couldn't go to the bathroom. They never stayed in the town. They didn't have a place for to eat, a place for them to sleep. Like I said, you know, this is a capitalistic society. You live, you you actually making money for these people. I think you're taking a lot of things you really don't have to take. That was Jackie Robinson. I hope you've enjoyed this interview with Buck O'Neill. I can only tell you that it's been my privilege to broadcast Major League Baseball games for the last 15 years. And that was as exciting and moving an interview as I've ever had a chance to be a part of. We'll continue to bring you more about the history of baseball in years to come. Thanks for being with us on All-Star Baseball 2004.